uh, I began uh, my uh, TV dongle project with the uh, notion that using modules as originally designed while adding and altering external circuits, it kind of produced benchmarks for comparisons. There's a few folks that like just to open up the, uh, I mean, there's a few things that I will just open up the box and start tearing into it, but this was a little different. Um, uh, with this presentation, we're gonna look at a ready-made gold-plated chrome buckets in uh, a little verse, digital versus uh, analog practice for perspective then a bucket full of artfully connected parts or home brew from finish to beginning. I like to, it's gonna like, uh, you're gonna look at it from the completed model working backwards. You're gonna do the tear down. And um, just in general here, just me thinking about uh, when I was gonna start this, I start this little presentation. There's a lot of things I've thought about and what do we want in a receiver? We want, uh, we want it to receive from DC to light, right? Um, uh, multiple modes, uh, you know, you can read it right there. High signal to noise ratio. That, that's kind of my, um, that's kind of my bottom line on things. There is a lot that can go on between the antenna and the speaker or the decoder or whatever you got. But if you've got a good bit error rate, or if you've got, if you can understand what's coming out of the speaker and it's way out of the noise. Just pull that signal out of the noise. I mean, that's my bottom line thing. But uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, uh, all that other stuff is important. Dynamic range and frequency stability. But dynamic range can be done with uh, some handles that uh, I'm going to show you here in a minute. But uh, there's some uh, uh, good words to, do, to Google there if you want to look at that. And you don't have to look them up now or anything. But just in general, it's the uh, the when you look at uh, sampling. Uh, sampling an analog signal and trying to turn it into numerical digits. The minimum is analog to digital sampling rate is normally two times the maximum frequency sampled. Always trying to figure the best way to say this. In other words, the sampler, the analog sampler is two times faster than the frequency. It's called the first Nyquist zone. And when sampling many signals above and below the tuned frequency may be found to have the same set of numerical data points. These are called aliases that will make ghosts and lines in your waterfall display. You are seeing something you don't want. That's basically what it is. Uh, like the backward uh, wagon wheel in old film strobing Western movies. I heard that example, so read that example somewhere. <laughs> However, some aliases could be an advantage when manipulated mathematically in software. You know, we're going to be talking about what the aliases are. There's, <clears throat> it's, um, uh, you, you think, well, what was it like images? Are they, are they, uh, not quite, not, not, not exactly like that. They're, uh, take a little bit of study on it, but you can probably look that up, but it's a, a mathematical duplicate of, of what you just sampled. Uh, typically without some means of filtering near the antenna, Direct sampling is a big barn door into the analog digital converter. And there's some of this stuff I might repeat just to kind of drive it home or something, but um, <clears throat> the, uh, let's get down to uh, the next thing here. Like, let's look at some comparisons, some ready-made stuff. Uh, it's uh, made for HF. AirSpy is one of them. And they got gray specs, dynamic range. It's like, thir that's 30 milliwatts. That's fi plus 15 dBm. If I recall, if I did that right, that's, that's well, that's a lot of power. And coming into your antenna, it, it can it's allegedly can handle it. Uh, the uh, it's thir it's uh, thirty milliwatts third third uh, order intercept and a low noise floor. And look and look at that low cost comparison. It doesn't even have an antenna connection. Uh, hi hi. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that's that was their sale anyway. And then um, we have uh, SDR play, and this one really is plug and play for Windows with the right program. It's, uh, uh, it's a little fuzzy understanding the specs, but uh, it has some common sense architecture. The, uh, if you'll read, if you look at the specs closely, they, they seem to change a little bit from um, VLF to two gigahertz, but that's, uh, you can probably look at that if you want to, if, if it matters. But uh, now I like, oops, I like the way that thing is built. It's, uh, uh, here's the block diagram. You have band reject filters. 
and any uh, anything that you might have as an IF. And did I say IF? We're we're not into digital yet on that thing. Gain control results in better. It, it's uh, if you have a gain control, it result, results in a better dynamic range. There's a, a bias T. That's uh, like phantom power for a preamp if you want it. And I've got an opinion about that, but uh, here in a little bit. But anyway, uh, that's an option that uh, you may or may not want. Then, uh, then you look, uh, you've got a bunch of bandpass filters. If you look at that block diagram, an RF tuner. And up to this, we're still not digital yet, except for the sharp DDS LO and, and the analog converter. Yeah, you know, there's, this is um, up to this point, it's, it's almost like your grandpa's radio, except for the DDS LO, which is uh, more like, uh, eh, your grandson's uh, DDS radio, but anyway, it's uh, then far right, the uh, AD converter finally, or the uh, also known as an RF processor than a USB output. I call it an RF processor, that's just me. That's analog to digital converter, that's what I call it. And uh, some people could argue the point if they want to. And what I'd like to look at uh, some expensive big boy SDRs the uh, analog devices ink that's isn't that an irony you know they they sell this the software to find radio stuff and they're called analog devices i thought that was really funny <laughs> anyway the, the uh it's uh, uh the ad 9680 direct sampling up to two gigahertz wow. with uh, some crafty use of aliasing and, and decimation those are the, those are bad words that can be turned into good words they're uh, uh, direct sampling is much more discriminating than analog, but it takes a fast DAC. I, I call it a DAC because it's easier to say DAC than analog to digital converter. But anyway, you have uh, they have a lot of oversampling. It it uh, they can do a lot of processing, and the right hardware it has the right hardware to couple the antenna. Uh, you want to have the right hardware to couple the antenna and keep out a, a few aliases. Um, then. Uh, Let's see, we're in, uh, let's go down here. Here's a block diagram. Now, just kind of step back and look at that. If you'll notice, there's an external low noise amplifier and a bandpass filter in front of all that. You know, you, it's, it, it takes some processing, but I like that because it's, you're, uh, you just don't, you don't have a big, you don't have a 40 meter dipole uh, stuck to that tiny IC. You know, you have something between, have a buffer between the antenna and the device. I think that's important. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the SDR is a, I call it a digital RF processor defined as a radio. That's, uh, that's me. But anyway, the, in the block diagram, you notice the, uh, uh, that uh, stuff on the front end, LNA and bandpass filter, it's on the same device. And you can see uh, uh, SDR is a digital processor. And I'm still working on understanding the digital down converter in the picture. There's a, i trying to get my head around the digital down, con, a digital converter. Uh, I, I do understand the advantage of assigning analog samples, a digital finite number that can be mathematically multiplied and separated from a, an infinite number of analog measurements. Think about that. You're just, <laughs> you, you can make all those choices and you can uh, take those samples and you can uh, do some math uh, math magic to it. Now, analog sampling, so to speak, think about it, is one divided by infinity. It doesn't make those doesn't make those choices. Whatever goes in, it goes out. If, it doesn't pick and choose. Uh, for example, either be satisfied with selective digital music, or bring back eight, eight tracks. In fact, I I got a few eight tracks, as a matter of fact. But anyway, the uh, uh, you. Uh, you're not sampling uh, anything with uh, total analog, uh, but uh, the deal is it's uh, uh, we're humans are too slow. We don't care. Uh, then, uh, okay, uh, here's another analog devices of 10 to 40 gigahertz uses an analog mixer in the front end. The IF is 125 to 800 megahertz uh, ADC, and that's there again. There's some fast sampling. Think about that. <laughs> you do that. Um, that's I mean, that, uh, I don't think your TV dongle exactly does that. Anyway, um, uh, point number one, you can make an HF radio out almost anything, including a TV dongle, if you understand 
what the components do best. Uh, a, a cheap dongle begs to be modified like an ARC-5 radio or Helicrafter S38. And as a matter of fact, I saw in a December QST in the same, <laughs> uh, same magazine and had one article about modifying an ARC-5 radio and also modifying a TV dongle. The only thing I would recommend in that, uh, in that SDR article is that I'd like to drive home a point that just try to pay attention to what kind of LO are you using, what kind of local oscillator, what kind of, what kind of uh, uh, device is, is uh, going into that mixer. And I think it matters, you know, just they're, they're not all the same. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd want to be able to read the specs and cause you never know where it's been, you know, those, some of those little, uh, those uh, little computer, uh, 100 megahertz uh, oscillators. That's why I built my own for one thing. At least I know what I had. Um, then uh, the this is the book. Yeah, right here. This is the book I should have should have found before this uh, slideshow. And uh, anything inside, uh, it's got some links in there. I would recommend uh, scribbling that title down somewhere and and uh, ordering that. It's just uh, it's I think it's just ten bucks. I remember on the on Kindle. Um, <clears throat> then we're going to get to the cheap version of SDR. That's where we talk. That's what we want to talk about or what I, uh, developed, uh, worked on there. And my first, uh, SD, my first Pi SDR was easy step-by-step, step, but I needed Mark's help on the windows version. Uh, the, the, the online steps are clear now and, uh, version three does not require surgery for direct sampling. And the uh, typical high Z junction that uh, that's inside that thing uh, now has some impedance matching. Also, the uh, later model has uh, uh, where you can do direct sampling. Uh, yeah, if I recall, yeah, that's right. Go, you can bypass uh, any. Uh, you can bypass the the first mixer on that thing and do some direct sampling for for HF. But uh, there again, I want to drive home the point. I wouldn't necessarily. Uh, attach a 40 meter dipole on that thing without some kind of uh, uh, interface. Um, there's several uh, programs that can run this dongle and I don't know which is best. I just used a console on my Windows machine. And uh, the uh, here's here's some of the insides. If you want to look at that, the big picture there, the, uh, there's a lot to look at, I guess. But anyway, uh, it's a lot of brag, a lot of things you can do. Um, Got a one point, yeah, one uh, per million TCXO, that kind of thing. It, it's still a TV dongle. Let's just remember that. Uh, the um, that's uh, uh, that's just uh, what I'm thinking. A lot has been added to uh, RTLSDR.com since I first looked. Uh, that's that site where you can see all this stuff. And uh, Mike uh, advised me, uh, gave me that tip that a lot changed there since I first looked at it. Um, and you want to keep. Uh, any, any gadget like this, you want to keep these TV dongles away from lightning bolts if you can. And, uh, you can get a low noise amp for VHF and above, but just don't see any reason for HF. I, I do see a good point about having some kind of pre-selector or, or antenna interface. And um, the, uh, uh, the Bias-T connects, they're, they're, the Bias-T option connects DC and decouples RF from the center conductor. You probably all probably familiar with that. But I prefer some type of external phantom power. And my philosophy is uh, separate components can die on their own. You, know, you could, you, uh, uh, like uh, I would uh, on this device, I would recommend some type of uh, shunt feed. And of course, if you have any kind of shunt feed with the bias T on, um, or I say shunt feed, some type of uh, shunt uh, transformer interface, that sort of thing. You're going to uh, you're going to mess up the bias T if you uh, if you have a short on the thing. Um, then uh, now here's here's something simple here. That's uh, this uh, this is what I would call uh, an anti-aliasing filter. <laughs> they're they're uh, cheap and they're uh, easy to work with. And uh, uh, passive or active analog filters improve and protect the digital devices but they are no match for their digital filters that have band corners. They have edges, they have like, instead of skirts, 
You've probably seen pictures, right? And uh, I just thought that was the coolest thing to see, uh, see all those rectangles whenever you're looking at digital filters instead of those, uh, those bells. Anyway, analog filters are faster, but we're too slow to notice. We, we're just, uh, believe it or not, analog can, uh, can respond faster. Now here's Matt's all band homebrew uh, antenna coupler. You know, he, he got some wire sometime back and I would, uh, I would recommend, uh, uh, um, if, if Matt, uh, Matt may want to build something like this anyway, it's versatile and simple. And, uh, I thought about that wire he found and, and I got this picture anyway, and some type of, uh, antenna matching to, uh, if you want to use that, uh, direct, uh, yeah, direct sampling on your uh, TV dongle, something like that. Or if you want to have some type of converter, which we're going to talk about in a minute. I have a few uh, CRT degaussing coils for a few whims and <laughs> just like just, my, just like Matt has. And uh, speaking of copper wire, uh, you can actually make your own uh, 160 meter Litz wire for something down. It, you can twist several strands in, in a vise, or of course you can buy Litz wire cheap. But anyway, um, also, next time you want to make a spare two meter antenna whip for the RV, uh, try giving uh, number 14 ground wire two revolutions with a drill in a, in a vise there and give it a little jerk. And you will be surprised how stiff and straight it is with a mild heat treat in the oven. And I'm just telling you what I've observed anyway. So I'm no metallurgist, but uh, that was that was interesting. Um, so uh, here's one of my hand, wheel, hand wound coils. And I haven't found a use for it yet, but I will. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, um, you need to put there again, put some hardware between the dongle circuitry and that big 40 meter dipo. Uh, so uh, my first SDR Pi program halted each time I touched the whip antenna. This is interesting because, uh, I, you know, you talk about uh, there again, it's, uh, uh, you look at a, a TV dongle and people aren't necessarily putting their fingers on it, right? the input well i did on that one uh that stopped when i soldered two diodes back to back across the dongle input it just uh, uh that way any static or anything like that wouldn't halt any program that way in the pi uh, the diode capacitance may attenuate a few microwave signals if that's somebody's concern but uh, not nine that's, that's the only thing i think of but um there's nothing like putting a couple of diodes across anything <laughs> that uh, doesn't require power uh, now, all right, uh, here's, uh, let me talk about an up converter and why I like up converters. You know, um, I have, uh, have the uh, elephant repellent, uh, theory, uh, my old partner, partner and I, uh, used to, uh, put, uh, uh, lightning protection on, on some community repeaters and stuff like that or commercial stuff. And we called it elephant repellent. If we didn't see any elephants, you know, that's, that's, that's the way you look at it. There's a, now if you have an up converter, you move the carrier of interest away from who knows which squirrels are chattering in your dongle. Now the, uh, uh, on, uh, with, uh, with an up converter, um, you, you know that uh, the elephant repellent is working if you don't see any elephants. That's that was the idea. So direct sampling in a TV dongle can be very selective for several frequencies and aliases. Uh, for example, the dongle has a 28.8 megahertz clock. That sound familiar? Uh, that frequency and uh, USB ports have a 48 have a 48 megahertz clock. You multiply 48 times three and, and who knows how many other times uh, you know, it gets in the hand band, the lower part. Anyway, you, you don't know which convert. I don't know which converter is best, but I'll show you what's in mine. Uh, you'll need a trap near the antenna for any IF you use. Uh, years ago, I recall often hearing a foreign broadcast station come rolling in while testing a Motorola portable. There's a certain kind of certain portable that had, uh, had a short wave band, <laughs> right there short wave frequency right there in the middle of the IF and, and you put a probe down there and well, you can hear foreign broadcast real good. It's like on an FM radio and never, I, that's, that's just, I just won't forget that right there on the test bench. Uh, in other words, uh, your cheap dongle has a wide, there again, a wide barn door that you may want to narrow. Uh, then, uh, 
we're going to talk about the completed project first, and this is my SDR. Uh, the uh, the pre-selector was previously made. However, a band pass is a little bit, a little less fiddly. I've uh, uh, since I had a a pre-selector, that's what I used. So, I would, if I was going to do this over, I'd probably just use band pass. Uh, uh, Pan pass filters because you know you gotta you have to at least have that uh, that pre selector calibrated to get you in the ballpark where you need to go. And this uh, you can see there, I my first contact uh, happened to be uh, an event station uh, on 40 meters there and copied some CW. And there's the close there's the fuzzy close up anyway of uh, CW on the uh, TV dongle using console uh, software. And I, I don't know one from another really as far as the software, but anyway, uh, uh, also there's a, another little device here on the bottom there, the uh, the Daytong. I picked that up some years ago and uh, it's, uh, uh, there's been various types uh, over the years, I guess. There's, that's just, you might call it an audio, uh, an analog uh, audio processor in, uh, it's it, well, it makes my uh, PC sound better anyway, and so uh, I've had some fun with that one. And you know, I could put all this in a box, but uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's just uh, what I got right now. And uh, I also use this on on field day, and uh, the uh, uh, I could. Uh, uh, this particular pre-selector, it, it uh, kept my HF antique from hearing the uh, same band, the CW chatter on field day. It's funny. I had a, uh, there's other radios had pre-selectors on and didn't think about it. And I just, I guess I just hang on to ham gear too long. But anyway, um, the, uh, I didn't quite understand why on field day, I'd hear this right there in the middle of side band and right there and the, everybody just presumed that's what it was. But anyway, I took this to field day one time and I, I uh, turned it on and off and was able to uh, demonstrate that sure enough, just a little pre-selector out there will keep that uh, same band uh, chatter out of there. And uh, let's look at the schematic of this thing. This is a, uh, uh, this, uh, this is a, a duplicate of, uh, well, excuse me here. Let me go down here. Looks like my, uh, Screen's trying to do funny things on uh, my choices. Anyway, uh, upper left of the schematic, that's an important thing, uh, especially for a TV dongle. Uh, it's uh, that, that thing can get swamped pretty easy. A, um, now we're not talking about the commercial, you, you know, there again, I'm, I'll probably end up buying one of those commercial types, but on the TV dongle, uh, you can sure get that thing swamped. Uh, a 50 ohm term is, uh, is used to check noise floors for birdies too. If you want to a little, uh, you can just uh, turn over there and see what you got without an antenna. Uh, a small, uh, my particular model, a small relay is sitting on each uh, toroid to switch two band groups. The uh, uh, the grounded gate gives about three dB gain, and and we don't need more than that. I don't want any more than that. <laughs> the uh, then uh, you can. Uh, that's just nothing necessarily. Uh, uh, special or anything, but uh, maybe after maybe somebody can send me a schematic on how to to build a uh, a pre selector with uh, without having to s switch bands. <laughs> like I said, I just use what I had. Um, then I have some uh, self imposed challenges. I wanted to run the converter and mixer of choice on a laptop voltage, and you know you think <laughs> that's uh needs a lot of filtering, decoupling, shielding, adequate USB conductor size, and a short run. And of course, I, at one time I did use a separate power supply for a long USB cable. And uh, and there again, the, the stable quiet, it's quiet LO. I wanted to see if I could make a quiet LO. That was my other thing in the back of my head. And then again, uh, could it be done? You know, in my particular, uh, uh, my particular, uh, mixer of choice it was a commercial mixer it had to have plus and minus five volts with a uh, a common ground in you know between the two right and, and this is a close-up of the converter uh, look on the lower left down there when both lower left leds are lit at least i know the uh 
8831 double balanced plus 24 dBm third order intercept mixer has plus and minus five volts that it needs. And here's here's the fun part is this how I did it. It's, um, well, we're going to get to that. Uh, oh, yeah, I put everything in there except the uh, FM trap. Again, you, whatever your IF is, you need a trap. I mean, we had a high dollar commercial radio sitting on my workbench, like I said, and it was picking up shortwave. Well, you need uh, uh, whatever your IF is, you need a trap. And some people say, well, let's use 125 megahertz. Well, I guarantee you'll find somebody there. If you can't, then there again, those elephants will show up. If you, if you don't, you know, you, they'll, when you least expect, suspect it, if you don't have the elephant repellent, they'll find a way to show up, you know? So I would recommend a trap on any IF you choose for your uh, TV dongle. And uh, my, I couldn't, this was an afterthought as far as using PL259s. I had, I had uh, uh, vintage RCA jacks on the back just for fun. But then in this particular project, so gee whiz, I want to use, uh, I want to use PL259s and everything. So I, well, I didn't have room for nuts. So I used the uh, barrels, PL259 barrels. So um, it seemed to seem to hold them. Um, let's see, here's the beginnings of it. And I was looking for a, uh, there again, this little $13, I just couldn't pass that up for what this thing does. This little, this little mixer right here. Uh, what I liked about it was, uh, uh, it's, you know, we have, uh, well, it's just uses a neg 10 DBM, uh, nominal, you know, it didn't take much, uh, much of an LO and, uh, uh, the one, my approach for the oscillators, uh, I tend to approximate values. So I don't, I hardly crunch any numbers, you know, but the uh, approximate, I use approximate values of lots of handles. See all the handles? See those, these little, those, all those little twisty things right there <laughs> to make it oscillate and make it uh, stable. It's, it's, that's my quasi-engineering engineering approach. And, and um, the uh, 8831 active mixer LO requirement was, uh, was perfect. Uh, I didn't want a, bottom line, I didn't want a QRP CW transmitter that a typical passive mixer LO might require. And um, the, uh, uh, see down here, it's, uh, that's the way I was putting it together. Here I'm working backwards here. This is uh, my start on that. And then of course you can run five volts to, uh, to, the, to anything inside there. That's, that's not a big deal. But while well, I call it a buck boost, it's really a, uh, uh, not exactly a buck boost. It's uh, well, we'll tell about that in a minute, but uh, I'll just show what's in there right quick. Uh, the uh, uh, the toroid above right of the uh, above right of the red red ag clip. It's a hand wound comma mode choke for both in and out of the converter. That hopefully that uh, you know you want to whatever you're gonna do to that darn thing, you don't want to mess up the PC or the converter. Uh, the small bent coil below the clip is a uh, 33.33333 megahertz trap. And what I did, I, I ran this thing, uh, the oscillator on the fundamental. And I, I don't know, I had this archaic notion that uh, it might be more stable if I begin with a, uh, the uh, fundamental and, and multiply it. But I don't know, it seems to work. You can see the finger stock for the uh, copper enclosure. I built a copper enclosure there. Uh, to, to keep all the all the goody in there because what I'm what uh, what I'm about to tell you about is uh, is pretty a wild wild gadget in there. The idea is I got five volts in there, right? Well, I want negative five volts out. That's the goal there. All right. Um, then uh, there it is, right there. See the five neg five volts up there. I'm measuring uh, on out of going out of there, and uh, you can see there it. Uh, it took uh, took a lot of cut and try there. Notice the trend, notice the former white common mode choke. It is now wired as a flyback transformer. A strip of iron was uh, glued to the secondary to get voltage slightly above neg five volts. Because I, I, there I was looking at the meter, it showed neg four dot nine. It just kind of annoyed me. I said, so, well, let's just, I'll just super glue a piece of piece of iron on the end of that thing, and, and sure enough, it came up the 
the the five point one eight. So who's going to argue about that? You know, okay, that's close enough. Five <laughs> negative five dot one eight as opposed to five volts. And then, um, so what's what's funny is I I I couldn't reach down there and snip off a piece of it. You know what I mean? To get down to five volts, but um, that's that's another uh, uh, thing we used to say in uh, the TOA business. It ain't no piano. You know, you, at, at some point you have to say it ain't no piano uh, after you tune it. Um, then uh, the uh, the junk box uh, IRF, IRF 640 on your left over there, that little. It's just a. It's just some type of a uh, some type of FET I found. Anyway, and uh, it's on the copper cover. It runs. It's amazing. It r runs uh, really cool at the right DC flyback frequency, and the. Uh, the uh, 555 trigger, 555 trigger uh, that uh, turns it on and off. It's uh, took a lot of cut and try it for the best efficiency. And uh, let's see what else is in there. The uh, um, here I got just a few more frames here. I think, and I think I'm, that's about it. It oh, it looks like a mess, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, the here's a part of the here's the schematic there. The schematic uh, like left to right. You see the fundamental oscillator slash tripler buffer. Uh, then there's two mimics used as a 100 megahertz tune tune amps to the mixer, and there's a fundamental trap. It's between the it's between the mimics, uh, the 33 megahertz uh, suck out there, and there's a five a big fat five watt zener and blocking diode keeps the voltage from spiking, and uh, down there in the power supply there, and uh, if you notice I put the in the schematic, I put the diode in the bottom just so I didn't confuse myself. <laughs> Man, it's a negative voltage, right? And uh, uh, data and power loops uh, through the uh, USB connectors and, and all those uh, feed through and bypass capacitors, uh, well, they just kind of make a wish. So um, how clean is my LO? I had a friend do this test and 99.97 uh, megahertz is the, is the middle spike. It's 5.44 dBm. That's what it shows on that uh, Julian Julian dollar instrument, whatever it was. And that's a great great level for the mixer. And uh, of course, the, uh, the software is the new frequency tuning tool. But you still need, if you notice back there, in what I built, you still need a screwdriver to tune out the spurs. And you're looking at a couple of them on either side there. And um, uh, but the 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 upside of those two little spikes, they're 30 megahertz away. It's a far enough away, but uh, it's uh, I'm going to shortly it's going to shortly show that they're tuned lower. The noise floor right there shows above uh, neg 60. If you just just above neg 60, something like that. And uh, if I'm interpreting what I see, which is uh, that's that's really takes the talent if you got it. Um, uh, interpreting what you see. All right, here, there's a closer look after uh, looking for just one stable, clean oscillator frequency. That was the other, that's kind of the goal goal of mine. It was kind of the back of my head. Yeah, I want to make a receiver, but I want to see if I can make a, a nice LO, at least one I can measure. I can see what it is. <laughs> it's after work. Okay, you ask, what am I looking at? Uh, there's a, it's a, a high dollar spectrum analyzer and um uh, and you can see the span is 100 K Hertz. And I didn't think that was too, that was, uh, that was the worst looking. I thought that wasn't a bad uh, uh, LO because uh, you got, uh, uh, I mean, let's see, how do you feel that? To me. 10, yeah, no kidding. 10 K Hertz there. And there's like, uh, it's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> and not only is. that is, and you see that neg 70 DBM? That's where the noise floor is. And that, yeah. that ain't bad for a, for a homebrew, uh, local oscillator. I don't think, but, uh, even the spurious that you had on that previous slide was pretty darn low. They, yeah. They were like and it, I took, I took one more little tweak and got it below 60. And, uh, you know, so, uh, that's, uh, that's what I'm looking at. And that's, that was, um, uh, you know, I may want to spend some money for a commercial, uh, LO, but, uh, I Why? still don't want to see the specs. Anybody got a source? Let me know, and I'll uh, I may build another one. But uh, uh, that little mixer was hard to beat as far as the price. Thirteen dollars or something like that. That's for the dunk converter. 
uh, that was for the mix, the uh, mixer itself. That okay. was the, the, the mixer. And that was at, uh, um, let's see. Any other questions about that? Uh, I'll tell you the model number of that, where that is. It's a, oh yeah, it's 8831 double balanced mixer with a, uh, well, anyway, it's, it's, it's got a good dynamic range. And so the object of that thing is to mix the 100 kilohertz, uh, 100 megahertz local oscillator with the HF signal so that you can feed it into the TV dongle. Is that what you're doing that's, there? That's correct. And okay. the idea is, and the idea was that, uh, you know, I was going kind of fast covering the, you know, fire hose thing, but anyway, the, yeah, it's a hundred. Uh, so I was uh, looking at 107 megahertz, uh, for 40 meters, you know, so, uh, yeah, I can milky with software and I can, ah, gotcha. So, yeah, all right. So that makes perfect sense. Yeah, and the, it's uh, uh yeah. Uh, what do you call it? The, not the IF. There's no name for it. The um, which part are we talking about on the? On the software, you actually can put in what that offset is. There's a name for it, but I've forgotten what we call it. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, IF offset. <laughs> I don't remember. Mark, do you remember? <laughs> LO offset. Maybe. That's it. LO offset. Okay. There you go. Um. So, um, but I, you know, I, I just ignore the one in front of it and tune it if I want to. And it's not like I'd use it every day, but in other words, I'm not confused with hundred megahertz. I would be confused. So I was using 125 megahertz. I, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but people perfect. say, well, gosh, that's hundred megahertz. That's in the middle of the FM broadcast band. Well, the point is I can see the elephants so I can get rid of them if I want to. That's you follow what I'm saying as far as the, um, uh, well, I've heard a term lately I don't like to use, but you've heard the expression, the, the devil, you know, <laughs> then it's the devil, you know, that you can deal with probably, but that's, uh, uh, anyway, uh, uh, the, uh, that, that's, that's my theory about, uh, uh, the use of the broadcast band, but, uh, uh, there, there's some air, there's some aircraft stuff around that 125 megahertz, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah you never Collins know. Uh, made a series of uh, radios, the HF80 series, that had 100 megahertz first IF to a 455 mechanical filter. So. Oh really? Yeah. Well, the, I was thinking the aircraft. I didn't. What I was thinking was, I thought the uh, aircraft radios had. Uh, 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 I thought 125 megahertz. What is 125 megahertz anyway? Yeah, that, that's in the VHF uh, civil right. aviation band. Yeah, there you go. You know, you might, somebody might fly over and see that, but, but at least uh, that's where I'm saying, even if you, no matter what IF you have, you need a trap in front of it. And, uh, but you're mixing it inside that box. How much is getting out back towards the antenna? Did, did you measure that? I'm sorry. Let's get say that. What's the last question? All right, you, the the 125 megahertz. Uh, let let's let's say you're going to try to tune 10 meters with this. So you've got your 100 megahertz mixed with 28 megahertz. So you got 128 megahertz signal um, going into your TV dongle. How much, if any, of that is going back up out of your transverter towards the antenna? Well, the cool thing is that's why it's called a double balanced mixer. That's what got my attention. The uh, it's the type of mixer you have, and uh, it, it don't like to go backwards. It don't like you know. It likes to. It it, it likes one uh, pretty well one frequency coming out, and that's that's uh, that's the whole point of a double balanced mixer. Uh, it's and, it's a whole lot more discriminating. And you've got a bandpass filter kind of on the front of this thing, so you're not going to get 125 into it either, right? So, uh, right. So what's or, the or 100 meg or whatever? Yeah. Seems, seems to me like you're covered. Yeah, that's a. Uh, so that was, but my there again, uh, the uh, the challenge for me was uh, how do I how do I connect this to a computer without uh, hearing all that trash? Well, you you get away from the trash if you can. That's that would be my advice. And, and there's reason people buy these. Uh, uh, there's a reason people buy these. Uh, up converters. I think that's a big reason. I don't know why they don't discuss that, but that's mine. Uh, 
Now the uh, there again the oh yeah the conclusions. Oh, I got one more slide. Sorry. Uh, uh, cheap a uh, I learned that cheap HF seems to work okay, and MOSFETs are hard to kill. <laughs> <laughs> that, that one mimics are versatile. That's a monolithic microwave ICs, and they've been around a long time. And uh, and I've I I don't know. You can use them for a lot of frequencies, I suppose. The point is they're 50 ohms. The cool thing is. They are a predictable uh, impedance, and I, somehow the ma I don't know how the magic works, but it's uh, no matter what the frequency is, yeah, they seem to be a 50 ohm uh, input, 50 ohms out. So uh, that's that's cool. Uh, also, the uh, I like the uh, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, commercial LOs cost more, and if somebody could find me a deal, let me know. But uh, How much quieter 30... are they than what you've got for crying out loud? I don't know. And that's where I'd like, I don't see, that's just it. I see them on eBay and, oh, here's a good LO. Well then, okay, what's the specs? I don't know. It's built in the seventies. It's probably pretty good. <laughs> the... your, yours, but your, your, yours is at least in close proximity to your signal. It's 70 dB down for crying out loud. Yeah, no kidding. Well, How much then, quiet are you going to get? Well, these these commercial LO, I mean, these commercial uh, SDRs, like that uh, uh, SDR Play DX, uh, their noise floor uh, in general is uh, uh, like neg, what, neg 100, I don't know what it was, 140, what was it? Whatever it was, it's way down there. It's below. It was $1,000. Yeah. The SDR Play DX, how much yeah. is that? The, I think thought you had it in there at nine ninety five or something. There was a that was a commercial. Uh, that was a commercial. Uh, uh, that was just a commercial comparison. I didn't mean to confuse the issue about oh. that. Those were those S were commercial. SDR Play is about two fifty, I think. Yeah, SDR Play. There's okay. a, uh, and I may get one of those. I, I didn't mean that's that's probably something I could have. Uh, uh, could have the, differentiated uh, there. The first, the entry SDR, the SDR Uno, I think, is a uh, hundred bucks, hundred and ten, or somewhere around there. But, but there again, I get to you. I get to look at the. If I get to look at the architecture and see how it's built, and I can see that, uh, oh golly, they uh, they actually throttle the uh, the input. Uh, they got some kind of a uh, automatic gain control, or uh, they. They tame the, they tame the, um, you know, they, they tame the front end somehow. Like, but it's like if you just hook up, uh, I mean, the first time I hooked up this thing and uh, there were big signals just swamp me, just just knock me off my feet, you know, as far as the, the it just wipes out your screen if you don't have some type of, uh, uh, some kind of interface that can uh, uh, attenuate the, the strong signals. Um and uh but uh yeah the uh yeah when i talked about the high dollar stuff the 900 hundred dollar stuff that was that's way up there in the like 10 gigahertz or something like that that was that's was radar stuff. okay and uh and they had uh uh that's what i should have mentioned but uh I, well i missed that you probably said it I, and i missed it well i was going as fast as i could mm. whatever well, you but, know, uh, while, while, while you're on that subject, I can think of a fairly easy way to put an automatic gain control in that with a, a couple of op amps. Okay. Uh, send me a schematic of that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It, yeah, it's, but, but, okay. but basically you just control the gain on the op amp right. with, with two resistances. Well, one of those resistances could be another op amp. Yeah. And it's just a ratio of two resistors. Is really all it is. Well, I'm sure there's some place to put that in that. Uh, there's probably some little place you can put that on that your uh, TV dongle. But, uh, you know, the thing that I like that I'm most impressed by on this, because I've, I've really loved your little box, man. This thing's a cat's meow. That minus five volt uh, converter. Yeah, I didn't know I if I could do it or not, but it's. Boy, I've needed. I've needed minus voltage uh, on a couple of projects to handle an op amp. And I've been able to buy these little chips that that will give me some uh, minus voltage. 
but it's not really as clean as, as what you came up with. The other thing is it's pretty limited in how much current it can handle. Right. So I'm, I'm really intrigued by your little five volt minus five volt uh, converter. Cause I'm, I'm betting that it'd be just as easy to make it minus nine or minus 12 or. Oh yeah. Whatever. I mean, you put the right, you, you, you put the right, uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, at that particular, uh, sweet frequency there, uh, sweet spot frequency, uh, that in that, uh, toroid that, uh, um, well, that was a common mode choke turned into a transformer. That was, that was uh, all you have to do is change the uh, Zener diode because <laughs> yeah. that thing just keeps going up and up. It's, it's a flyback. It's not even a, it is a wild haired thing. You know, it's a, it's a flyback circuit. <laughs> uh, but once I, uh, you know, what I did on that uh, 555 I, on that schematic back there, um, that was, uh, 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 I used, uh, some, uh, trim pots and then it's, then I, once I found the, the frequency that, uh, that had the least heat in the highest, uh, current capability, um, that ratio there, whatever, um, what did it think, uh, uh, I forget 15 K Hertz or 17 K Hertz, uh, a day. I think you told me what the, flyback frequency was a flyback uh frequency of a flyback transformer 1575 kilohertz. Yeah, 15, yeah 1575 i don't know what the my mine my, my was uh somewhere in the ballpark of that <coughs> so uh that was um used to be able to hear it 50 years ago well uh <laughs> hopefully that thing uh, hopefully I, apparently I was able to filter out enough, um, where, um, uh, it, uh, attenuated it and, uh, tuning that, uh, tuning that circuit, uh, certainly helped do that too. But anyway, um, anyway, the, uh, it's, a uh, yeah, it's, they're just, the TV dongle is one of those things just beg to be best with and, that I just soon buy an SDR play DX next time I have the dough. <laughs> the only problem with the the TV dongles, they only go down to about I think it's 60, 55 megahertz. So that's yeah. why I need the up converters. Right. And that's well there again, those uh, uh the newer version you can in software you can uh 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 yeah jason you can uh with with the right software you can bypass you can go to direct sampling but there again they're not like there's nothing like the high dollar ones uh i don't suppose um where was that thing yeah anyway uh i oh, believe yeah. there's yeah there's a direct sampling circuit enables hf reception you, you can and they actually have some low pass filters in it, but they, in other words, they modified this dongle. It's a version three and, uh, it, uh, it's, you know, you can, it's, it's got, uh, <laughs> where am I getting all these? I'm, I'm using terms. I don't even like to use. You can put that lipstick on a pig anyway, but there's, it looks, it's still a pig and it, but it's a not, not a bad looking pig. I have the version three on here, but I thought it could only do like VHF and UHF. Uh, 25. Well, on this one, uh, I think it is like specifically, I think this is 25 megahertz is, is the lowest on this one. I think hmm. now there again, uh, uh, the direct sampling can go lower than that. You can, there's a, uh, if, if you go to that site, uh, Mike, what did we say it was? SDR.com. There it is. That's right the there. Yeah, it's right there in the dongle. Yeah, SDR.com. And there's articles in there. And I haven't monkeyed with the software myself. Uh, there again, that just wasn't my philosophy to hang a 40 meter dipole on that thing. <laughs> so, so you can make it receive HF, is what you're saying? Yes, you can. That's what I was trying to say there. Direct sent. You have a. You look at that, the slide I'm looking at right there, uh -huh. you can do it. 
a direct with the right sampling. software. Yeah, and there again, and also I would recommend uh, either Matt's uh, Matt's antenna tuner or mine, or just come up with some kind of little uh, shunt interface. And uh, now I kind of went by it fast. There's an option in here to uh, put uh, voltage on the center conductor. Everybody got that? I guess there, there's an option you can do that. So that's software controlled. If you want so, to look over this picture, that'll. Uh, it's a. Uh, this picture's on that. Uh, that site there, Jason. If you want to look at that, but. So the, do you have to do anything, like to it, to make it do HF, like to the actual the like dongle. Uh no, you you don't. You can actually. Uh, in other words, you don't have to take the cover off this time. Mm -hmm. Earlier versions and other ver other TV dongles, you have to. But on this one, you don't have to take the cover off. There's a, if you notice there, it says direct sampling circuit mm -hmm. enables HF receptions. And it's got, uh, there again, oh. it's got some type of matching. But uh, that is a very high impedance point, super high impedance point. And they, they allegedly have some kind of transformer in there that uh, compensates for that. But uh, anyway, it's... Uh, uh, it's a still it's a really fine pig it's it's a lot of fun to mess with mm. you're mentioning antenna tuners uh technically antenna analyzer but i have my uh bud lavelle special uh altoid can uh oh yeah whatever you know it's yeah a uh aa 30-0 you see you saw my point right about mm -hmm. instead of hanging up a, a big long wire on the center conductor of that little SMA female connector, mm -hmm. I would recommend some type of interface, some type of uh, uh, shunt uh, uh, T uh, antenna match or whatever you call it. Uh, something that goes to ground. Mm -hmm. Take that thing to ground. Just don't mess. Make sure you don't turn on the bias T. Right. I, I hate for that to be an option, but I don't like that bias T option. The, well, uh, I would be I'd be hard pressed to do a forty meter dipole, considering I live in a six hundred square foot apartment. So yeah, well, um, okay. Well, you know, you know I, what I, I mean. I do, I do have like a ver an, an HF uh, vertical antenna uh -huh. I can put up because I do have a little yard out there. But when I yeah. say yard, it's like you know, like I think my kitchen is bigger than the yard. Um, but it's I can put a vertical antenna out there. So. What, well, it, what it's, you're worried about, Bernard, is too much signal strength coming into this thing and damaging. Is that right? Well, either that or let's say some uh, uh, some type of stray ground. Let's say, uh, oh, well, let me hook this to the gutter. Well, <laughs> let's say that gutter happens to put an alligator clip on the gutter. Well, that gutter happens to be maybe uh, uh, to maybe there's a uh, an AC ground somewhere that uh, it doesn't exactly match the AC ground that uh, goes to the rest of your equipment. It's it's just a lot of things that can happen. A line and strike, uh, static, and the other uh, thing I mentioned about, uh, I had my ras my first, that Raspberry Pi slash SDR for the little spectrum analyzer, the little band scope I built. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, it, every, every time I touched that antenna, it would halt the program. <laughs> it just my, just from the static of my, my fingers. That's funny. And uh, so that's another reason to uh uh have uh, uh some external <laughs> circuit uh with back-to-back -back diodes just go pick some tiny back-to-back -back, uh diodes and they're and you're familiar with that circuit right where you uh something anything above 0.7 volts uh i'm not familiar with this well, i definitely the, have to read up on it well it's a uh uh, I don't know what do you call it, bud. It's a couple of bio uh, protection, just a little anti-static protection. The uh, two diodes back to back turn. Just, just a clamping circuit. Clamp, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's really uh, all it is. And you take, yeah, you're, take two diodes back to back, and it it won't let a voltage. So the two diodes back to back on the ground won't let any voltage greater than 0.7 volts either either way. Yeah, or you can go get into a, your machine. Yeah. Or you can go get a 6AL5 tube and do the same thing. No, yeah, there mind. you go. I like your thinking. <laughs> I know, it's just a flashback. I'm sorry. Well, hey, uh, hey, you, hey, think about it like this. Now, you, you mount that 6AL5 inside your transverter box, and you'll stabilize the oscillator further by keeping it hot. 
Uh, I don't know. I, I, as a matter of fact, <laughs> one thing I did is that I have this big, uh, I, I think I mentioned it in one of the slides, I had a big chunk of aluminum. The idea is you want to keep that thing fairly cool at some point. And so I had a big chunk of aluminum separated from the box because I didn't want the, the dongle heating up my oscillator, you know, monkeying with that frequency, at least somehow maintaining room temperature somewhere. Uh, so uh, uh, that was uh, that was the other reason to try to keep that thing s separate. I but, do uh, like this um, uh, thing. I, so I went to the RTL SDR website um, and there are their blog post uh, from 48 hours ago is information about receiving the GOES-13 weather satellite. That'd be cool. I, I all, all kinds of stuff. You can do all kinds of that stuff. You don't need a converter for all that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you can, uh, uh, this looks kind of weird there, but I have a, a chunk of aluminum underneath the box. It's just screwed to the bottom of the box. Mm -hmm. comes out here. I can still take the top lid off if I need to, but uh, the uh, yeah, that was uh, but I, if I build another one, I could uh, I'd probably use bandpass filters just to if you select HF bands or something. QRP, you know, QRP makes those little bandpass filters pretty cheap. The um, uh, but uh, yeah. Oh, they also have how to receive the uh, weather balloon data on there. I think I put it on our club Facebook group one time, but there's a guy in uh, probably about my age in upstate New York that uh, shows you how to track the uh, weather service weather balloons. And he, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's this exact one, but he uses, you know, something like it. Um, that and like a direction finding antenna. What frequency are <laughs> Like, what freak? Well, what is it now? I should know this. Is this just in the program? Um, I think it's like 160 megahertz. Yeah, <laughs> some, it might be something like that. You know, VH, somewhere in the VHF experimentals or whatever, or the weather stuff. Well, the um, uh, uh, yeah, it, there again. Uh, uh, the I uh, just uh, you guys, I'm a, picking up. Oh God, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the video started playing automatically. It's uh, it's sick. It, it's it depends on which one. So some weather service offices do, which this is what ours is, is somewhere around like 1680 megahertz. 1,680 megahertz. And then uh, other weather service offices use one that are around 403 megahertz. So it depends on like what model they're using, but I know ours is the like 1680. Yeah, you can get, uh, yeah, if you if you want to, you probably put a preamp in front of that. And there, yeah, I'd, I would use a, an external power, they call it a power injector, but uh, it's uh, used for, uh, used to be used for TV amplifiers, that kind of thing. But uh, you can probably use a bias T. The only thing I'd, I would uh, use whatever that uh, site recommends. I, you might, uh, uh, because at least you know what, how much current it's drawing, mm -hmm. you know, the specifications on it. But. Yeah, pulled his website back up. He uses, because I, I think, yeah, I seem to recall he has like a little amplifier. Yeah. On it. Well, you can stick that antenna up there. There, there again, you could uh, stick a uh, uh, little beam or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ten minute okay, warning well, I again. Guess I'm done. Yeah, you know, I, I don't. I, I got nothing. I just posted I a link in chat else. to the uh, blog. I was talking about. Be careful! It played a loud video when I started it. That's what all that ruckus was. Yeah. In my background, that's the first ones I bought. It was in a blister pack like this. You had your dongle, and a yeah. little antenna, and a remote, because it's designed for TV. No, I have the same one. My antenna is right here. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, Bernard, uh, that yeah. that pre-selector looks looks like a, a bandpass filter, or is it really nothing more than an antenna tuner? Now, if you look uh, back there in the schematic, it's a uh, uh, it's two tuned to circuits. Goes in, it comes out. Of. Yeah, what did I do with that thing? There it is, right there. It's a uh, uh, it's one barred from uh, some Canadian guy, uh, but I modified the uh, turns ratio, the turns on the thing to make it work for me. And look at that, I've got two diodes back to back. Yeah, you got them right back to back going straight to ground, and, don't you? And uh, yeah, come, come, I probably need it up there really. But anyway, I got it, uh, got it down there. And these are just down here. These are junk box resistors I threw together and they just, they don't look pretty, but they, I, I tried to use short leads and stuff, uh, but HF, it don't matter that much. It's a grounded, grounded gate fit, like a grounded grid amplifier. And um, uh, just think of it like that. And it's a, a ganged, uh, uh, these little uh, capacitors right here are ganged. So it comes in and goes out of uh, the, uh, uh, I have, uh, let's see, I'm trying to look at the. So it's an active bandpass filter. It's an active is. band. Well, it's an active, uh, yeah, it's a, a pre -selector. it's a pre selector. Yeah, I would. I'd rather call it a pre-selector because it's. I wouldn't call it a preamp. I don't want a. I don't want an HF preamp. I just uh, even though that I have noticed it seems as though I have about three dB gain on most of the. So what's the difference between a pre-selector and a filter? Uh, a, a filter is my understanding. It's a little more passive, but. Tunability. Well, pre-selectors are tunable. Yeah. Pre. Yeah. Okay. Pre-selectors are. As tunable. opposed to a bandpass filter. Right, LC bandpass filter. Yeah, if you look back up here, this uh, you can buy those from uh, uh, what was it? QRP. QRP yeah, Labs. I saw that. QRP That's kind of Labs. A good thing. Hand Summers. Uh, where was I? Yeah, there was. Uh, yeah, there was. Um, Yeah, where'd I have the little picture of the QRP thingy? It was... Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. Anyway, those are QRP labs. You can... $5 a band. And that's probably what I'd do if I built another one. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> He's got one. Just I got like that. one. <laughs> hey, I got, I got a 40 meter one myself. I haven't used it yet, but I'm going to use mm. it somewhere. An another, a another way to... Uh build your bandpass filter and just put a uh, quarter wave shorted stub in parallel with your antenna. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there's, um, but the, the idea is somehow match the, uh, anyway, the TV dongle, just don't want to kill your program or your dongle when you're hooked, right. hooking up, putting some on that center conductor. Yeah, there can be a lot of static on that long wire. Yeah, Just or the, the wind blowing across it. Yeah, the short wire. That is, I had, you know, the first one I had to just put my finger on the on the thing. I stopped my Pi program. I just had to restart it. Well, that's 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 your uh, electromagnetic personality. Oh yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. The uh, the, uh, the, uh, the low pass filter, you know, it's over a band. Uh, the the pre selector is a little bit sharper. If, if you'll notice the, you'll notice most modern uh, radios, I've been told, have uh, low pass filters in them like that. And um, the, uh, but my antiques had pre-selectors. They were a little bit sharper. And that's why I mentioned that uh, once I stick a pre-selector in front of my IC745, uh, I, I tuned out all the the CW chatter and got to hear anything I wanted. As a matter of fact, it was, uh, it, it did seem to make a difference as far as pulling some stuff out of the mud. Pre-selector is sharper. And, and you're, and you, so, so you're, you're switching the band on the pre-selector and then just tuning for peak signal. Right. And the only reason I have the switch on there is because I'm not smart enough to make it tune the whole, whole, have one coil tune the whole whole band and there's there's ways of doing it uh the uh, uh there's uh 
uh, let's see, what was it? Uh, Tintech had a two very two coils that had had a little uh, powdered iron. Uh, had some just would uh, move the powdered iron up and up and down out of these coils. And uh, one thing about it, the uh, uh, tuning a coil, the permeability of change the permeability of a coil. Yeah, I believe is a little more linear than uh, using a capacitor anyway. But anyway, it's what I did works. I just put these tiny relays right there, sitting right there on top of those toroids, and I'd short I'd, uh, sh I shorted turns to make it tune the bands I wanted. But uh, you anyway, I like uh, anyway the. Uh, Well, anyway, that was, it's just a, uh, well, a grounded, grounded gate uh, is less likely to oscillate to hmm. uh, a grounded, like a grounded grid amplifier. <laughs> oh, Mike, did y'all do the, uh, the, uh, what you might call it, the satellite ground station set up this last weekend? No, I don't know if you saw the follow-on message, but uh, uh, David Forbes' backyard neighbors is a brewery going in back there, and so they had to move the, the storage units and a bunch of other stuff to make the, the, the property line correct. And so that whole area, is, it was full of stuff last week. And I don't know mm -hmm. if it's been cleared out yet. So I'm looking at, uh, let's see, maybe the, so the first Saturday of December, take a look at the weather and stuff. Okay. Yeah, I, but I, don't, but I don't know if the backyard's been cleared out yet. I haven't talked to him. Oh, there it is. I see. It. Yeah, email on Friday, November sixth. I was wondering if anybody else saw one of those Daytong FL one audio processors. Those uh, mm. they're little audio. They're, I think, uh, some people might have called uh, like. They're like a super regenerative audio thing. There's something called uh, a selecto jet way back when. Uh, kind of they just made really sharp audio. Anybody see anything like that? There's nothing digital about that. Is it passive? No, it's an active, uh, some type of active. Uh, let's see, where's it? If I can get in that thing. You can change your bandpass on the frequency or the. Uh, it's an audio pre-selector <laughs> with with a variable gain and pass back.